Hello and welcome to the Relationship Warehouse, where we're here to provide biblical insight, information, and relationship tools to help you have a healthier, more vibrant relationship in every area of your life. Uh, this is Dr. Rick, and I'm Matthew, and it's great to have you with us today. Today's segment is going to be on forgiveness. So Dr. Rick, what are we, what are we going to talk about related to forgiveness today? I thought what we do, we spend our time talking about what forgiveness is, what it is not, and then kind of a simple exercise or a tool, if you will, um, on how to actually seek forgiveness and then to grant forgiveness. Because you think about it, I mean, there are so many people talking about forgiveness today, even in the church, but we're really not practicing it uh, functionally. Mm. Because you look at the amount of breakdown in marriages in the, in the body of Christ, the, the disruption in family, church, church family splitting. Mm-hmm. Because we're not, we're not working together, we're, we're, we're angry, we're resentful, and we don't practice forgiveness. And so that unforgiveness creates all kinds of disruption in the family. And so what we want to do is focus on what is it. Okay. So now I'm thinking that most everybody sitting out there today is thinking forgiveness. I mean, we all know what forgiveness means. It means you forgive and you forget and you move on. Well, is that really the definition of forgiveness? No, we'll start with the definition of forgiveness here. So um, let me kind of do it this way. If you're, you're writing, uh, writing it out, here's your definition. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it twice for you so you can get it down. Forgiveness is a choice. It's, it's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a decision that a person makes to give up their rights. We'll talk about what those rights are in a minute. Mm-hmm. To give their rights for vengeance, retribution, and negative thoughts towards an offender. And so I'll say that again. The forgiveness is a choice that a person makes to give up their rights. Rights for what? For vengeance. Uh, a retribution and negative thoughts towards an offender. And I think I want to do is kind of use John chapter 8 as a catalyst here mm-hmm. to kind of get us uh, understanding it. Um, and that, John, John chapter 8 being, which story is that one? It's the one where the woman was caught in adultery. Oh, okay. Jesus yes. is teaching in the temple. And they want to stone her, if they I They want to stone her, exactly. Yeah. And they bring her down there into this classroom and they're going to, they got stones in their hands. It's mm-hmm. really clear. And they ask Jesus, so they say to Jesus, Teacher, this uh, woman was caught in the act of adultery. Moses said that she should be stoned. What do you say? Mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't answer the question, by the way. And he basically stoops down and writes in the dirt. Whatever he writes, we don't know. But at some point, he stands up and says, You who are without sin, cast the first stone. Cast the first stone. And it says, From oldest to youngest, they drop the stones and walk away, leaving Jesus there with the woman. And in that moment, Jesus looks at her and says, Woman, where are those that condemn you? Interesting. She felt no condemnation from the teacher huh. she felt none because she says there's no man lord no right. one here right and he says i don't condemn you either what go in sin no more sin no more but, but but hold on dr rick i mean come on now you gave us a definition of forgiveness right right and now we're talking about a bible story here right and, and there are folks sitting out there they're thinking right now when they're in the heat of the moment with their spouse or when they're really aggravated with somebody at their job or, or their next door neighbor or whoever it is do they really going to think of the definition and are they really going to reflect back to john chapter 8 I hope so. You hope so. Here's my, here's my, here's my parallel for us. Uh-huh. The question is, did the, scri- did, the, did the scribes and Pharisees actually have the right to stone her? And the answer is yes. yes. They quoted it. Right. Moses in the law said, and here's my parallel. Now, what I'm about to say is going to get some people riled up, but just stay with me. I'm very <laughs> process-oriented, so just kind of hang with me. Don't turn the, you know, turn the TV off right away. You can do it later if you want. Here's the parallel. Whenever someone hurts you, wrongs you, or offends you, you actually have the right to stone your offender as well. Because wow. God knows that for every offense, there is a debt, and that the person who was offended has a right to pay the debt. Mm-hmm. You actually have the right. Moses and the law commanded. They knew it. That's why Jesus never answered their question. He knew they had the right to pay the debt. Mm-hmm. The problem is basically this. In a sense, Jesus asked this question of them. Though, guys, I know that verse in Leviticus as well, that you have the right to stone her, and I know you have the right to stone her, I do have one question for you. Before you throw the stones that you have the right to throw, are you eligible to stone her? Hmm. You hear the shift? Yeah, absolutely. And so we would say in our work that because of the definition, you have the right to stone those that offend you. Right. The problem is you're not eligible. So I Hmm. ask you, out there are you eligible to actually throw the stones because for every stone you think you can throw at your offenders then the lord looks at you and says well look at those people behind you and so you, hmm. you start to look at those people behind you and go who are they and the lord goes well see those are the people who have the right to stone you mm-hmm. 
And we all know it's a level playing field of the cross. Mm -hmm. So herein lies the dilemma. You've been hurt by your spouse. You've been hurt by your parents. You've been hurt by a coworker. You've been hurt by a church family. By a church family. Uh, you may have been hurt by a pastor or someone. And you, you have the right to stone that person. What they did was wrong. It was an offense. Mm -hmm. The question is, are you eligible to actually throw it? Well, the obvious answer is no. The obvious answer is no. So let's go back to our definition then. Okay, back to the definition, which is? Forgiveness is a choice to yes. give up your what? Your right. Rights for vengeance, retribution, and negative thoughts to the offender. Who has the right to throw your stone? It's the one without sin. Well, that would so, only be Jesus. Exactly. So forgiveness is literally when I'm willing to give up my rights and give them to God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. I repay. And he will throw the stone however he wants. But see, now you're talking about that means I, me, the folks there in the audience, uh -huh. you. That means we all have to trust God to actually carry out vengeance. When, when we're in that moment and we're angry and we're feeling it and, and it's not right and we're going to let somebody have it or right. whatever, I mean, that is totally contrary for what you want to do. Because the, that flesh part wants to pay them back. Absolutely. Because part of you knows you have the right. Because they deserve it. But you're not eligible. Wow. And so therein lies the definition. Now, here's an inter interesting thing you just alluded to. And think about this. When you give up your rights to the one who can throw the stones, which is God himself, mm -hmm. if God chooses to throw the stone at your offender and give them cancer, mm -hmm. so be it. Oh, and by the way, if God throws a stone and gives your offender a $250 million Powerball lottery, mm -hmm. so be it. Because once mm. you give up your rights, you give up any say-so to what he does with it. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and see, and I could see in a home, in the, in the kitchen, I mean, uh, you, you know, because whenever there's, there's a turmoil at our house, if there's anything between Gina and myself, the, the first place it's felt, it's not the bedroom, it's the kitchen. Because really? the kitchen is where you live. I mean, that's where you're... Actually, you lose it you, us, it's really quick. Oh, man, yeah. You know you know that it doesn't matter about the bedroom because it's in the kitchen at that point. There's the thermometer or, right. or barometer or whatever. But so you're saying that if she's done something that really hurt me and I have every right to let her have it, that the right thing to do, the godly thing to do, is to choose to not exercise that right because I'm not eligible. Realizing I'm not eligible, yeah. I lay that stone to the side, per se. Not that I carry a stone around with you me. You give them to God. Yeah, God, and I give I, it to the Lord. I, I, I want to do something here, but I recognize I have to let this go. Okay. Now, this hasn't happened in my marriage, but I know that I've talked with folks over the years in my church where there have been folks, or, or other churches, where there have been infidelity in the relationship. I mean, are you asking for the one who's been pure who has not had an affair, to forgive the one who has? Yes. Wow. You also forgive the one that murdered. You also forgive the one that stole. Mm -hmm. You forgive the one that called your names. You forgive the one that has hurt you. You forgive the one that's put you down. Even if that's your father or your mom or your stepmother or, and we keep going. Yes, because this is a part of my own personal journey of growth and healing, you see. Um, and may, I think I'll come back to that story in a minute to kind of help put all this together. Okay. Um, let's talk about what forgiveness is not for a minute, because I think it's important that we understand what forgiveness is not before we move on to why forgive in the first place. Though. Okay. All right. All right. Why do we want to forgive? And that, that's a different segment here. Um, let's talk about what forgiveness is not. Number mm -hmm. one, you alluded to it earlier. Um, forgiveness is not forgetting. That's actually impossible to do. Hmm. All right. And, you know, some people go and refer to the Old Testament verse, God forgives and forgets as far as the east is from the west. And, and I always tell people, go back and find that verse. You'll never find it in the Old Testament because that's not what it says. It says God forgives and remembers no more. Yeah, you're talking about Psalms 103, verse 12, as I recall. Okay, that's why you're a pastor and, not, and I'm not, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a very good verse, though. Okay, so the, the idea here is that forgiveness is not forgetting. But when you do forgive, when you let the issue go, you choose to not revisit it. Thus, you don't remember it anymore. It's not that you forget it. It's just I, it's a dead issue for me. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for me to revisit it because I let it go for mm -hmm. me. Right. All right. So forgiveness is not forgetting. Think about it this way. 
if you're watching today and you or you know someone who was sexually abused, the question is, can a sexual abuse victim forgive their offender? And obviously the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But don't you think they'll always remember that they were abused? I think that pain would stick with them for a lifetime. Not just, well, the pain doesn't have to. Oh, okay. The memory would. Oh, memory. You can uh, well, heal from right. the pain, but the memory would. We, we haven't differentiated between the pain and the memory yet, so we'll, yeah, we'll come yeah. to that because in a moment. Because you can, you can forgive someone that's hurt you and heal from the pain of what they did, mm -hmm. but you'll always remember they did that. I mean, you, you, it, forgiveness doesn't, doesn't give you a frontal lobotomy. It doesn't take out memory. Uh, but, Dr. Rick, when they remember it, wouldn't the pain come with that memory? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Think about it this way. If I was to pull up my pant leg, I'll show you a scar. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right? Now, when I got that scar, it hurt. It, it hurt. hurt for a long time. Absolutely. I have a scar, but there's no pain. Ah. You see, time heals wounds, even mm -hmm. wounds of the heart. Mm -hmm. Time heals those. Mm -hmm. the, the difference is, I, I remember when I got hurt. I remember when my dad shocked us with a cow prod. But the pain of that has been healed. Okay. You see? And what uh, God so wants see. is the healing of the event that took place. Mm -hmm. But you'll always remember that those events took place. So, so forgiveness doesn't take away pain. Pain has to be healed over time. Okay. You'll always remember what took place. Okay. All so right. like when you were, you've referenced a, uh, the scar. Right. So tell me a little more, I mean, what, I don't understand a physical scar because a physical scar, after time, no longer do you, you don't feel pain there, but also, quite honestly, over the physical scar, you run your finger over it, and usually it's, it's, it's kind of numb almost. Is that different emotionally? It, it's not that you're numb because numb would indicate that you haven't healed yet. Okay. You're still detached from the pain. Uh, emotionally speaking. Emotionally speaking. Yeah. Because, see, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to bind up the brokenhearted, Isaiah 61, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, so... God does heal wounded emotions. Yes. So that I can sit back now and think about things that happened in my childhood and in my life that, you know, 20 years ago when I thought about them, created, I mean, I felt the pain. Mm -hmm. Today, more mature, more whole, more healing. <laughs> I can talk about those things and I don't have the amount of pain. You know, there are certain things I can talk about right now where even some issues six years ago, the moment I talked about them, there was energy there. Mm. I can talk about them now, and the energy's not there. Yeah. So you always know when a person's healed by the emotional response they have when, they're, when they talk about it. It's not good or bad, because mm -hmm. it takes time to heal. And the way you heal wounds is through comforting it. Mm -hmm. And so number one, it's not, it's not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Number two, forgiveness is not necessarily reconciling. In other words, just because you forgive your offender doesn't mean you'll actually have a reconciled relationship. Oh, okay. Because forgiveness, we'll, we'll learn here in just a minute, is really about you. Reconciliation is a relational issue. It takes two to reconcile. Okay. And forgiveness does open the doorway for the possibility of reconciliation, but in and of itself, it is not reconciliation. So if someone has hurt, uh, um, somebody that's in the audience or hurt me or what have you, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to renew that friendship. They're going to renew that relationship. Forgiveness just opens the opportunity for that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Exactly. Think about it this way. When, when Christ died on the cross, based on our worldview is, is, is Christian theology, mm -hmm. when he died on the cross and he asked his father to forgive us, mm -hmm. biblically speaking, all humans, past, present, future, were forgiven. Yes. So the question is, is he reconciled with everyone that was forgiven? And the answer is no. no. Why? Right. Because some don't want to be. Right. And so, again, it doesn't open the doorway for, it doesn't mean reconciliation. It does open the doorway for the possibility of reconciliation. Okay. All right. Third, forgiveness does not condone. It doesn't mean that what you did was right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't condone what you did. Nope. What you did was still wrong and you still get the consequences. And some people think, well, if I forgive them, then it means what they did was right. Actually, it doesn't. Mm. You know, you can forgive someone that, uh, that murdered, but they still get the consequences for murder. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't condone anything, all right? Mm -hmm. Next, forgiveness doesn't restore trust. Mm -hmm. uh, trust takes time to be earned back. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, forgiveness opens the door for the possibility of trust to be restored, mm -hmm. but the other person has to earn trust, and that takes time and consistency. And, and how do they do that? How, how would one, if, if, if there's a lady out there who's forgiving her husband or a husband who's forgiving his wife, or what, how, how would they go about building or reestablishing that trust after forgiveness has taken place over whatever it is? 
Well, I think in that question, we have to think of a particular scenario. Let's, let's talk about adultery. Okay. You know, you've had an affair with another person on an ongoing time frame. Number one, you'd have to stop the relationship. You'd have to make mm -hmm. yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've learned about brokenness, brokenness doesn't demand anything. Mm -hmm. It does whatever it takes to make it right. Mm -hmm. And so you would begin to see those kinds of behaviors, accountability. And if you call them 10 times a day, just to make sure they're not messing around, I would say to the offending partner, well, you know, you created this fear. Mm -hmm. If they need to call you 10 times a day then in order to get rid of the fear, well, why don't you be okay with that, right. you see? Because right. you say you love them, you want to undo the fear that you created. If you, if you do the things that help minister to the fear, well, then the bottom line is they will probably quit calling you 10 times. They'll <laughs> drop to eight, then they'll drop to five, they'll drop right. to three. And next, you know, you may get a loving phone calls once or twice a day. Right, right. You see, rather than fear-based phone calls. Mm -hmm. And so you do what it takes to earn trust back based on whatever the situation was. Right, All right, right. So it doesn't restore trust. Next, and we kind of alluded to this already, is that forgiveness doesn't heal pain. It opens the doorway for your pain to be healed. But think okay. about this way, um, Matthew. Unless you forgive, you'll never heal from the pain. Okay. Because unforgiveness blocks the healing of the pain. Okay. Forgiveness frees you to begin the healing process. Hmm. Which then leads us to why forgive in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is really that forgiveness was not meant for your offender. It was really meant for you. Hmm. Think about it this way. For every offense, you get a stone and you get to throw your stones at your offender. Yeah. So how many of you right now are holding at least one stone in your heart? Oh, I've got to believe that the people out there are holding dozens of them in their hearts, not just one. I know a man right now that uh, was, was um, you know, intensive that we do with troubled marriages. He said 50 stones that he could think of. Now, if each stone weighed five pounds, because, you know, you're going to hurt your offender well, right? Mm -hmm. So it, 50 times five, 250, that gentleman is carrying 250 pounds of extra weight based on the number of stones that he's carrying. Now, what is the weight of these stones? It's the resentment. It's the bitterness. It's all of that hurt and pain that weighs your soul down. Yeah. That will lead to depression, it, that anger, and it leaks out and hurts other people. Mm-hmm. But if you were to give up your rights, symbolized by the stone, right. if you gave up your rights, then guess what else you'd be giving up? You'd be giving, uh, you'd be giving up the, uh, literally surrendering those stones. You wouldn't have to carry them around with you anymore. You'd be giving up the weight. Yeah. What's the weight? That resentment and bitterness. So when you give up your rights to the one person that can actually throw the stones for you, mm -hmm. you give up all that weight, which is what God wants for you. He doesn't want you living with a heart that's filled with resentment oh, absolutely. and bitterness and fears and insecurities. I, I've heard people say before when they've given their, their testimony about the time when they came to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, how they felt like this weight was lifted off of them. Is that somewhat some of the same idea that you're talking about? Yeah, it goes back to the idea. It does. It goes back to the idea of John 10:10, 10, 10, the mm -hmm. abundant life heart, you know? Yes. Um, I, I kind of believe that the abundant life heart is really when we're experiencing the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, and goodness. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it that keeps you from experiencing right here, right now, as you're watching me, as you're watching us, what keeps you from experiencing love, joy, and peace? Well, actually, it's anger, resentment, fears, and insecurities, and bitterness. Okay. To the degree that you're angry, resentful, and bitter, and uh, fearful, and insecure, and worry, you can't have love, joy, and peace in the moment. Right. You see? That's so if right. I choose to give up my stones, what really are the issues of the past. Mm -hmm. the, the stones represent things that have happened to me. Then I'm no longer angry, resentful, and bitter. And when I'm no longer angry, resentful, and bitter, what happens? Love, joy, and peace move back in oh, well, sure. to your present state. And so you're no longer feeling one, you're actually feeling the abundant life heart. Oh, abs absolutely. And, absolutely. And, God, and, you know, God came so he might have an abundant life heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the people in your life in the past that you've had a hard time forgiving. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked is just as friends. Oh, absolutely. Those journeys, you know, me in 2004 had to work through a lot of uh, unforgiveness areas. And it's interesting, too, because sometimes you'll get uh, something will happen in your present and you'll get an intense reaction like for me. Mm -hmm. And not to realize that what I was feeling in the moment when I went and got some help from a colleague of mine, I just said, look, I don't need your friend of you as, as a counselor. And for two and a half hours, um, I just sat there and cried and cried. And when I came down, when it came down to it, he said, I know your problem. And of course, I said, what? <laughs> and he looked at me and goes, uh, you made this person a father figure. It's another father that failed you. Mm -hmm. And I realized that all of this stuff I was dealing with in the present was really linked to my dad. Mm-hmm. 
And then I realized, you know, Lord, why now? Why now do I have to deal with all of this at this level? And Father's response was, because now, Rick, you're, re you're ready. Yeah. You're able to. Right. You weren't ready before. So well, you, you alluded to a moment ago about in our friendship and how we've talked together so many times about the differing um, relationship or the, mm -hmm. the journeys that we've been on and so forth. And, and I can think of in, in 2006 a, um, a work-related issue for, for me and how I didn't want to forgive those people because I knew. I didn't believe. I mean, I knew they were wrong. Right. And you had a lot of people who knew they were wrong and supported you and understood it. Right. Objectively. Absolutely. But then from there, I really recognized and experienced exactly what you're talking about. The fact that if I held on to it, it was, it was almost like I was drinking battery acid or something. And in that battery acid, it was eating, the in, it was eating me from the inside out. It wasn't eating them. You know, that's a great way to put it, battery acid. I never thought about it in that kind of a imagery before. But it is, because it does eat your oh. soul alive. Oh, it does. You know, it destroys you. I mean, I, I think about my own personal journey. Um, and, well, at this point, when, when I was 30 years old, so I'm 48 right now, um, 30 years ago, I was raised to hate my real mother. And probably this is a story to kind of put all this together. Mm -hmm. I was raised to hate my real mother, my biological mother. I had a car, Mrs. Como, growing up. I was never allowed to refer to as mommy or mom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, being the good little Marks kid, I did what my dad and my stepmoms taught me to do. Sure. Um, but uh, 30 years later, never having bonded to my mother, and my dad being dead for a while, um, when I was turned 21, he, was, uh, he, he died. And so I really, never really attached to my dad, never bonded to my real mother, and never bonded to my stepmother either. Mm hmm but she's the only mother I've known. And uh, I went through on this one particular night, I was really angry, had all this energy, and I sat down and started to write this letter to my stepmother. Mm. And just all those years of hurt and anger came out. And in the midst of this writing, this conversation takes place in my head. Now, actually, I was answering God back out loud. Fortunately, it was about 11.30 at night and my family was sleeping. So, right. you know, they would have got some medication for me, I'm sure. <laughs> But um, this conversation begins to take place in my head. And the first question the father asked me was, uh, what do you want from her? And I actually said back, I want her to appreciate me. I want her to accept me. Mm -hmm. And father said back to me, she can't. And I said back to him, why not? And here's what he gave me. Because apples don't grow on orange trees. And I wasn't <laughs> sure what that meant. And so he said to me, where did she get it from? And I thought about that, and I realized the very things I needed from my stepmother, she never really got either mm -hmm. in her life. And for the first time ever, I actually empathized with my offender. Wow. Which really is the litmus test. It's the litmus test for true forgiveness. It's when you understand why your offender did what they did, and there's empathy for them. I didn't say it makes it right. I did not condone it. It's what Jesus said on the cross. Mm -hmm. Father, would you forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. He's empathizing with his offenders. Yeah. And in that moment, I actually forgave her. Mm. I actually forgave her because I realized she didn't have it to give me. Yeah. But here's why I want our audience to know today wh why you don't forgive in the first place then. It's because you still want something. What I realized mm. from that was I was looking um, for an apple, and my stepmother was an orange tree, not an apple tree. Yeah. And I wanted her to be my mom. I wanted her to love me. I wanted her to accept me. So I was going through my anger and resentment. I was going to beat out of the, what? Orange tree, mm -hmm. an, an apple. apple. And it's never going to happen. No. And here's why. If we give up our stones, do we trust the Father to meet the need? You yeah. let go of the expectations of what you want from your offender, and you let him meet it. Now, here's the neat thing. God will meet your needs. Because I remember I said to Father later, all right then, where do I get a mother? This shows you how disconnected I was. Because I, I said to the Father, <laughs> where do I get a mother? And he said to me, you've always had one. I actually said back out loud. I actually said to the Father, I said, who is it? That shows you how detached I was. Wow. And he looked at me, looked at me, he said to me, you've always had one, she gave birth to you. Mm. And for the first time it hit me. I mm. always had a mom. I was just raised to hate her. Right. But as an adult, I still did. So what I did at 12.02 a.m., 
I picked up the phone and I called my mom. Mm. And uh, she answered the phone. I said, Mom, and in the family, I'm Ricky. And uh, she said, Ricky? And I said, Mom, I realized something tonight. She said, what's that? I said, you're my mom. And she said, welcome home. Mm. I got a mom when I was 30 years old. What kept me from getting it was my unforgiveness. And what you mean by mom, I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about a relationship. You're a talking relationship. about love. You're talking about all the things that, that anyone in their right mind out there would want and desire. Because my unforgiveness of my stepmother was really my attempt to make her my mother. Yeah. The mother that I wanted. Right. She didn't have it to give me. Right. So I have to trust the Lord to meet those needs. Yeah. And he took me to the apple tree, <laughs> which was there all along. I just rejected it because I was going to make the orange tree give me the apples. Sure. And whenever we try to do things our way instead of doing things God's way, right. it always works out like with nothing but frustration and, and, and absolute, um, I, I don't know, it, it gets us nowhere. Right. So in our last minute and a half here, how do you forgive? It's when you can look at the person that hurt you and, and say, you know what? I'm no different than you. I'm equal to the cross. I forgive you. And for those of you who've hurt someone, they need to ask for forgiveness. Do you care that you did it first and foremost? If you care, that should produce remorse. Godly sorrow produces repentance. And out of that remorse, you go to them and you say this. You know what? I did whatever it was. I did it. I was wrong. No excuses. Mm. It really doesn't matter what the excuses are. That's right. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And hopefully your offender will. If they don't, that's not your issue. Your issue is to seek forgiveness and change. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I think it's a great place for us to end today's segment on forgiveness. Uh, this is a Relationship Warehouse. This is Dr. Rick and I'm Matthew. You can see on the bottom of the screen our website. So if you'd like to go and send us a note, ask a question, or look for some additional tools to add to that relational toolbox. But I tell you, as Rick has said over and over again today, and I totally agree with him, it all starts with our personal relationship with God. We find the, the truths in the scriptures, and from there, God gives us the tools to be able to work with those around us, those that he's sovereignly given to us. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you the next time on Relationship Warehouse.